so I'm going to be sharing the slides. So Steve, when you want to advance, just say advance and I'll do that. I'll try and keep a eye on the chat thread, uh, but uh, if I miss something, uh, feel free to pipe in. And uh, Steve, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Wendy. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, some of the faces on the screen I recognize and work with you guys in the past. Um, and as a result, you might, one of the things I like to do in, in these presentations is, uh, I know we like to wait for sometimes for questions to the end, but I, I'm one of those guys that if it kind of pops in your mind, you got a question and I'm going through a particular slide, uh, do not hesitate to, to chime in or try to uh, get my attention and I'd be glad to answer their question. Um, but anyway, it's, it, as you guys know, obviously we're in, uh, in a very uh, difficult and interesting time. And um, I think with regard to COVID-19 and vaccinations, and one of the things that's come up is that, you know, we've had, a, I've had a number of discussions with my clients over and regarding vaccinations and whether they can require it and, you know, what's a good policy and concerns that they might have with regard to implementing a vaccination policy. So today, as we kind of walk through this this morning, um, again, I would encourage you to ask questions. You don't need to wait till the end. You can, you know, flag me now. We can talk about it or we can wait to the end if you want to go through it. But I'd like to kind of walk through some of the practical considerations and uh, hopefully kind of share with you guys some of the legal thoughts and perspectives and things you need to watch out for as an employer. So Wendy, if we can start with the, the first slide. Um, so one of the things that I think that, um, you know, you, we, that really we need to think about when you start looking at this and this issue is, you know, why really should employees get a COVID-19 vaccine? Um, one of the reasons why a lot of the information that I'm going to be referring to in terms of uh, medical information or guidance really comes from the CDC. And obviously, um, most of you probably know this, is that the vaccines appear to be highly effective at this time at preventing COVID-19. Um, so it's, in fact, more effective than, for example, your annual flu shots. Um, I think more than 90% effective is what the, the uh, studies have shown it to be. Um, it also helps individuals in terms of keeping employees from getting seriously ill. And obviously as an employer, I think that's something that's that's really important. You obviously wanna protect your employees. Um, you wanna make sure that they and their family members uh, are, are safe. And the vaccine is a is a, a one way to do that. Um, uh, and obviously, not only are you talking about protecting your employees and their families, but you're also talking about possibly customers or patients, for example, if you're in the healthcare industry, um, protecting those individuals as well. So it, there's some really strong reasons for, for that to happen uh, in terms of why we want vaccinations to occur. Um, and it's obviously uh, a safer way to build protection against the virus as opposed to simply contracting it and building some sort of natural immunity to it. Um, there's also something I think that employers need to kind of keep in mind when looking at the uh, vaccine and trying to decide what to do in terms of whether to implement a program that either is mandatory or voluntary to have vaccines in that under OSHA, uh, employers have a what's called a general duty uh, to keep their employees safe and free of recognized hazards in the workplace that are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. And it's not mandated yet, at least by the federal government or by OSHA, that uh, vaccines be used as part of keeping individuals safe, but it is something to keep in mind. And I, and, I, and I point this out because I think one of the issues that's gonna come up with regard to vaccines has to do with what happens if you decide not to implement a vaccine policy that being either mandatory or voluntary. And with this guidance out there from OSHA, like I said, this general duty clause to keep individuals safe in the workplace, you know, could you end up kind of somehow running a file by, uh, of, of OSHA's directive uh, by not implementing a policy uh, in the workplace regarding vaccines? And it's something, again, it's developing. It hasn't, there haven't been any cases on it. Uh, there's really no guidance on it, but it's something I think employers need to keep aware of, that there may be some sort of a duty. It's not real clear yet, but there may be some sort of a duty 
for you to actually implement a vaccination policy under federal law. Okay, Wendy, the next page. Go. Now, you know, one of the things that's been interesting is that um, we've heard from a number of employees, and I know the vaccine is only sort of rolling out in December, but there are a number of employee concerns that have been raised. And I would encourage you, if you are looking at this issue and you want to be able to respond to employee concerns, or at least understand the concern itself, you know, the CDC has a great website and talks to me about uh, concerns that um, could arise and reasons why employees might be reluctant to become vaccinated. And one of the one of the issues, one of the things you hear is, well, you know, it's going to make me sick. Will it make me sick? Um, there are certain side effects associated with the vaccines. And right now we're talking about Pfizer and Moderna. Those are the two that have been approved. There may be others coming down the line. But it, in terms of sickness and illness, according to CDC anyway, that those vaccines will not make you sick because they don't contain any of the, the live virus. In fact, um, they are, as I understand it, messenger RNA vaccines, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that the science right now, research shows that these vaccines will not make you sick. So I think one of the things that, that uh, employees need to understand is that, look, these vaccines do not contain live viruses uh, or weakened viruses for that matter. So uh, it won't. Now, that's not to say that there's not a risk of uh, some sort of uh, allergic reaction to the vaccine or side effects. I mean, that, that happens with any, any vaccines, but the risk uh, according to the CDC is fairly small. Um, one of the other questions you get is, well, if I'm vaccinated, uh, I might spread the virus to others. Again, uh, the science seems to suggest that simply because you get a vaccination doesn't mean all of a sudden you're a carrier of the virus and you're going to spread it. In fact, as I pointed out, there's no live virus in the current vaccines. Um, another issue that comes up from employees sometimes, hey, I've already had COVID. You know, I've got this natural immunity to it. Why do I need to get vaccinated? And the, and the answer to that is quite simply that uh, we don't know how long that natural immunity would last or is going to last. Uh, there's some suggestion that it lasts at least 90 days. But with the vaccine, it's another measure to take it to extend that immunity to the extent that you might have acquired it naturally. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, COVID-19, the, the vaccines currently available, they are called what's messenger RNA vaccines. And for those of you who are in the healthcare profession, you probably know more about this than I do, obviously. But uh, what it's a, this, these types of vaccines, I guess they change. Uh, or they direct the body to produce a certain protein. And one of the concerns that sometimes you hear is, hey, I don't wanna take something that's gonna change my DNA. Uh, and that's not gonna be the case. Um, but my understanding is, is with regard to these messenger RNA vaccines, what they do is they go in and they do give a signal to the body to produce a certain protein that's similar to the a protein that's found on the virus. And so as a result of that, the body then develops an immunity in response to that particular protein, but it's not changing the employee's DNA. Um, the other question or comment that we've been getting is, hey, listen, I already wear a mask. I do social distancing. I follow other CDC guidelines. You know, Really, do I have to get a vaccine? Just doesn't seem necessary. Well, again, the vaccine is, is one way in which we're trying to combat this pandemic and keep people safe in the office. So yeah, we, we need to continue to do those things that the CDC is recommending in terms of their guidelines and vaccines are part of that. So, you know, when communicating with your employees about it, I think reminding them that vaccines are an important tool in that for us to prevent folks from getting sick or contracting the virus. Um, you know, and then of course, I always get this, this comment, um, hey, you can't require employees to be vaccinated. You know, if I don't want you to vaccinate me, it's my body. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have any right to do that. And that's, that's really not the case. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. I, I, I want to say this kind of one of the things that's been interesting in terms of this vaccination issue. Uh, you know, I work with some healthcare providers. I, and and one of the things that I'm, that it's interesting is that even some of the healthcare workers have shown a certain reluctance 
to the vaccination and there's been some difficulty getting individuals to voluntarily sign up for that, even though, as I said, the science seems to indicate that the benefits of the vaccinations are, uh, are important in helping to stop in the spread of COVID. But there is, a, there, is a, uh, there is a reluctance out there. And so I think it's really important to kind of educate employees, to direct them to the, the resources where they can uh, get information on their own if they're like with regard to COVID. So next slide, Wendy. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, one of the, the things that sometimes individuals state, and this not, I, I, you know, I singled out employees, but this also sometimes has to do with managers and, and uh, employees that I speak with. You know, yes, you can require vaccinations, um, particularly with regard to COVID-19. Um, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has said, yes, uh, employers can require that. It's not a medical exam. It's not a physical. Um, you can't do that. Now, there are some exceptions that we need to talk about. And um, these exceptions have to do with certain conditions. So, for example, if an individual has a disability, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. If they have a disability, we may have to make an exception with regard to vaccination. Um, and then also, if the vaccination or being vaccinated is conflicts with an individual's sincerely held religious belief, um, we may need to make an adjustment there, consider that in terms of vaccination. So those are the main areas where there may be exceptions. So let's go to the next place. All right. So I want to kind of you know, talk a little bit about disability issues. Now, and really, when we're talking about a disability, um, we're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And Oklahoma has a similar provision. And really, if you follow the ADA, then you're generally in compliance with Oklahoma law with regard to disability discrimination. So one of the things that, that, that may happen in these situations is you may get an individual say, hey, uh, I have a condition where if I take this vaccine, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause me an illness or it's going to cause, cause me to have an allergic reaction, or uh, I'm going to go through, uh, have, have some other uh, adverse consequences, either mentally or physically because of the vaccination. And when you're confronted with that as an employer, um, you know, I think some of you may be aware of this. There's, if someone's able to demonstrate that they have a disability under the ADA, and an ADA under the Americans with Disabilities Act an ADA is a physical or mental limitation, um, usually uh, that substantially limits a major life activity. And so instead of taking um, you know, that, ind that the individuals, uh, uh, I hate to say taking their word on it, but you really do need some medical documentation uh, from a healthcare provider, of course, to identify first whether that individual actually has a disability. And if they do have a disability, then why, how that disability uh, is somehow um, causes an issue or a vaccination might cause an issue or cause an individual to suffer an adverse consequence because of the vaccination. And so in order to do that, what you need to do as an employer engage in what's called an interactive process to determine, you know, first of all, whether that individual has a, in fact a disability and whether there's some sort of reasonable accommodation to, to overcome those limitations. So in certain situations, it's very possible that if someone does in fact present you as an employer with information demonstrating that they have a disability under the ADA and that as a result of that disability, they can't take a vaccination because it's likely they're gonna have an adverse consequence as a result of that, then you might actually excuse that person from uh, the vaccination. But again, that is one of those situations where you need to be very careful in term, terms of getting information from that individual, having that individual's healthcare provider provide information so that you can make a qualified decision. Okay, Wendy, next one. All right, so the next exception that we talked about that I mentioned has to do with religious discrimination. And religious discrimination in employment is governed under what's called Title VII. Uh, and basically what Title VII says requires that an, an employer make a reasonable accommodation of an employee or applicant based on their sincerely held religious belief, absent undue hardship. So 
this issue comes up from time to time in, in, in terms of uh, vaccinations. And we've had experience with this, particularly with regard to the healthcare industry and flu vaccines. Um, we've had situations where individuals will say, you know, hey, I don't, I don't want to take a vaccine because it's against my sincerely held religious belief. At one point in time, for example, there was uh, some issue with the Catholic Church in terms of vaccines. There was some argument that this had to do with flu vaccines, that these vaccines were somehow derived from uh, unborn fetuses. And as a result, um, it was, you know, good Catholics shouldn't be vaccinated. Now, the Vatican has come back and said, no, that's not the case uh, anymore with regard to vaccines. But those are the kind of issues you sometimes run into. And this idea of the sincerely held religious belief is, is a little bit tricky because you can have a sincerely held religious belief and you know that belief may not be associated with any particular organized or well-recognized religion. In fact, it might be you know, only a handful of people in the United States or Oklahoma might have this particular belief. And the EEOC, quite frankly, is a little wishy-washy in, in, in determining or deciding what is a sincerely held religious belief. And so, um, in, in fact, what it says basically is that, well, the employers really shouldn't give too much scrutiny to what is a sincerely held religious belief, unless, of course, um, they have some reason to doubt it. And, you know, and I'm not sure actually what that means. But, but the reason why I bring this up is because, um, you know, sometimes I've had, and this has to do with the flu vaccine, the experience has been with this, is that you've got folks who have some beliefs and from a religious perspective that are very much outside what I would call uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the main uh, population, uh, very unique in terms of their views. Now, one of the things, though, that I think needs to be understood with regard to this, and this, I think, in the healthcare profession is, is really uh, something that's something to keep, to keep in mind. You know, you don't have to provide an accommodation uh, under Title VII for as far as religious discrimination if it causes an undue hardship to, to provide that. In other words, there's a difference under Title VII religious discrimination between that and the ADA, because under the ADA, you also don't have to provide an accommodation if it's going to cause an undue hardship. But the standard, the definition of undue hardship for religion has to be more than a de minimis cost on business operations. So, for example, one of the things that in a healthcare environment, for example, you might say, okay, I understand you have a sincerely held religious belief, but um, this is an undue hardship. Uh, for example, you know, if we provide you with this accommodation, we may be threatening the, sa the safety and health of patients. We can't have people working in the hospital uh, in an area where they, who refuse to be vaccinated because it may pose a, a threat to patients. Um, if that's the case, in that situation, it may mean that the accommodation or the cost of accommodation is more than de minimis. So this is one of those areas, like I said, it's a little tricky but essentially, when you're dealing with religious discrimination issues or, or accommodation issues, you know, if it, if it increases a burden on the employer and it's more than just a slight cost, for example, if you have to end up people that would work around this individual have to adopt certain policies or procedures, maybe moving offices or uh, moving, uh, changing work schedules, things like that, that's generally speaking more than de minimis. But this is one of those areas where you need to be very careful about. And I see for an employer, this is probably going to be the trickiest area to deal with because a number of folks raise this issue. Um, but I want to also make sure that you understand that religious or sincerely held religious belief is not a, a, a political belief. It's not an economic belief. It's not a social belief. You know, if, you're, if someone says, hey, I, you know, I strongly believe that the federal government shouldn't be involved in our lives, or I strongly believe that employers shouldn't uh, dictate what I do in terms of what goes to my body, that's not enough. It has to have some sort of religious uh, connection. So, Steve, if an employer was uh, confronted with a situation and was concerned that an unvaccinated employee with this religious belief would be a, a danger in one setting? Could they give them alternate responsibilities or reassign them to a different kind of work? 
yeah, that's that's possible. That may be an accommodation that you can make. Now, but keep in mind um, the obligation to accommodate with regard to sincerely held religious belief. If if the cost is more than more than de minimis, then you don't have to provide that accommodation. So, for example, let's say you have an individual that says, "Hey, I've got this. You know, this is I have a sincerely held religious belief. It prevents me from being vaccinated. Okay, that's fine." And as in order to accommodate them and keep people safe, you might have to, you know, move people to different shifts or job responsibilities, things like that. Then you're putting a burden on those coworkers that, that is more than de minimis. And in that circumstance, it may not be a reasonable and necessary accommodation. So when you look at this situation, if you see yourself, you know, you know, changing other individual schedules, you know, moving things around in offices, doing things like that then you're starting to get into an area where, hey, you know, maybe you're going beyond what is required of the law. Now, that doesn't prevent you from doing that, but it's something to keep in mind um, as you kind of look at your business and what you what you need to do and what you plan to do. All right. Thank you. All right. So one of the other things, too, that I think you need to be aware, uh, mindful of, um, it has to do with uh, GINA or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And what it prohibits is, GINA prohibits discrimination on the basis of genetic information. So when we are conducting these vaccinations, for example, when I say we, I should, I should really be talking about healthcare providers who are providing these or individuals who are administering the vaccinations. Many times they're gonna be questioning individuals about family history or uh, issues they've had in the past. And that could reveal genetic indicators or information that would run a, run a file of, of GINA. And what I recommend is, is that if you decide to conduct vaccinations or require in, in employees to do vaccinations, and quite frankly, right now, it's, it's probably not a practical situation because of the shortage of the vaccine. But if you get to that state where you're doing that, I would re highly recommend that you have a third party or uh, someone else conduct those types of, the, conduct the testing or the, the I should say, the, the vaccinations, because that way the employer isn't asking these questions. If you, the employer asking this information, and for example, family history, things like that, you could end up running a file of GINA. So the better thing to do is to have a healthcare professional uh, outside of the organization, for example. Uh, you can do it within the organization if you're a healthcare professional, but having that information segregated and kept away from the HR files and things like that, because that could raise some issues in terms of bio, potential violation of GINA. Hey, Wendy, the next one. Okay. Uh, I don't know how many of you um, uh, have uh, involved in a union workplace, but one of the things to consider in terms of uh, testing, or I should say vaccinations, is that you need to take a look if you are in a, have a situation where you have a group of employees in your workplace that are that are subject to a collective bargaining agreement or CBA. You need to take a look at that agreement. <laughs> um, you need to see what management can do. Uh, and for example, does management have the right to mandate vaccinations or to implement a vaccination program? Um, sometimes these CBAs are written. These agreements are written. And it, to the extent that the union and the management have to negotiate over those types of situations. So if I you know, want to implement a vaccination policy or change the policy uh, that we might have regarding health and well-being in the workplace, I might, you as an employer may have to go to the union to do that. The other thing is, even if you have the right under a CBA to do that, you need to give the union notice that you intend to implement such a policy, even though you have a right to do so in the CBA. So it's something to kind of keep in mind. In this part of uh, the country, we don't have a lot of situations where this applies, but it's something to keep in mind as you think about you know, implementing a vaccination policy. Okay, Wendy. Um, another question that comes up is, what do you do if you have, uh, someone does have side effects? You know, And let's say you've required that individual to uh, get a vaccination, um, well, it, it could be covered by workers' comp. It's possible. If they miss work as a result of a vaccine that uh, caused a, 
a reaction that um, you know ended up making them miss work or being out of work for some period of time, it is possible that that is covered by workers' comp. I would encourage you to reach out to your workers' comp carriers and talk to them and, 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 and see what they are recommending and whether they are denying these claims or moving forward. And like I said, it's, it's one of those issues that we haven't seen anything, I haven't seen anything like that just as of yet, but I suspect this is gonna come up and it's something to keep in mind. Um, the other question that comes up is what about pay, you know, wage and hours? Say if I require an employee to go out and get a vaccination, you know, do I have to pay him for that time? And generally speaking, if you require them to go out to get that vaccine during normal working hours, yes, you have to pay them for that. Um, what about overtime? Uh, you know, do I have to pay them overtime for going out? Well, generally speaking, if they go out and they get vaccinated outside of normal uh, working hours, generally speaking, that would not constitute overtime. So it really kind of comes down to what their normal hours are. So if you tell the employees, say, listen, we need you guys to pro provide proof of the vaccination uh, and they go out on get it done uh, at a clinic on a Saturday and they normally don't work on Saturday, generally speaking, that would not be covered under overtime. Um, what about bonuses for getting vaccinated? So some, a lot of companies, what they're doing, it's interesting, they are instituting um, these voluntary programs and they're incentivizing employees to go out and get vaccinated by saying, hey, we'll give you four hours of PTO or we'll pay you for an additional four hours, even though you're not really working and to just get that back if, you're, if you prove that you've been vaccinated. And generally speaking, um, the reason why this is important is that um, if you are dealing with someone who is a non-exempt worker under the Fair Labor Standards Act, you know, sometimes bonuses need to be included in calculations for overtime pay. So if you get a bonus um, in a certain work period, then you need to, you're effectively the regular rate or the rate you use to calculate overtime will go up as a result of that bonus. But generally speaking, when it comes to vaccinations, Again, if you're not doing, um, if it's not during working time, the bonuses would not be included in terms of the calculation for a regular rate for overtime. Okay, Wendy, next one. Now, one of the things that I, that, you know, obviously we've kind of gone through some of the legal issues associated with vaccinations, but I think, you know, ultimately this comes down <laughs> to a business decision. And uh, I, there are a number of factors I think you would want to look at. Uh, as an employer in terming, determining you know, how you want to, when you want to implement a vaccination policy or program, be it mandatory or a voluntary. And the first one is the availability of the vaccine. And right now, you know, obviously it's a pretty limited supply. Um, I, I think that you know, employers might consider based on that, hey, let's, let's encourage people to go out and get the vaccine and they may encourage them simply verbally to do so, or they might simply do something where uh, like a number of employers are doing right now, for example, offer them some additional PTO if they provide proof of vaccination. Um, that's something to consider as you look at this. You know, Right now may not be the time obviously for a mandatory policy, but as far as a voluntary policy, it may be, may be something to look at in terms of, of moving forward. Um, the other thing is employee morale. Um, what I found interesting in this is that there is a, um, you know, there's just a, there more than a few individuals in the workplace who are very uh, leery of vaccines in general. And um, there are a number of employees who are leery of, of, of employers telling them to, you know, put something into their bodies. And so I think you need to kind of take a look at your workforce. You know, how do you think your workforce will, will respond to this? I think with regard to healthcare workers, generally speaking, they may understand um, more than others the importance of vaccinations. But even then, in those situations, we've had some pushback from, from employees who work for healthcare professionals who don't want to have the vaccine. And so how is that going to impact the, the morale in the office? I think that's something important and it's critical to look at in terms of trying to figure out what you want to do in terms of a possible policy. Um, obviously, we talked about this before. Can you achieve, achieve results through a voluntary program? I think right now, a number of employers, that's where they're going. They're, they're pursuing that. And like I said, that's based in large part on the fact that there's limited availability. Um, the other thing is, 
I think you need to make sure that if you're going to adopt a voluntary or mandatory policy is you need to make sure that you, you're kind of informing your employees uh, of the, you know, updating them, giving them the information about the vaccine, uh, the science, you know, having them, providing them information, for example, from the CDC, uh, letting them know, you know, why you're doing this, why you think this is important. You know, that information um, may alleviate some of the concerns that folks have that, you know, that, that, hey, this has been well thought out, this is based on science. And I think that's important to do. I think education and communication with employees whenever you're implementing policies is important, obviously, but particularly with regard to the vaccines. Um, another concern that I think you ought to think about, and this is something that I am, I've heard a little bit of litigation on this, is liability concern to third parties. So for example, you know, if you are a healthcare provider and you choose not to require vaccinations or implement a voluntary program, and let's say a patient can back, contracts COVID uh, and they claim that they did so at your office, um, you know, an argument might be made by a plaintiff's lawyer, look, you have a duty to keep my client safe. You knew that this highly contagious virus was out there and that it could be, uh, you know, it could have severe consequences, consequences for folks with compromised immune systems or for individuals who are over the age of 65, yet you did nothing. You sat on your hands. Um, and the same thing has to do with vendors, you know, people who visit your facilities and your places and they say, wait a minute, you know, you understood that. That, that there was a problem in your workplace with regard to COVID, you did nothing about it. And, you know, we're gonna sue you for that because, you know, uh, my, this particular vendor, the guy that came to work on the copier got sick and, and died of COVID. Those are real concerns. And I, and I think that as we move forward, I anticipate we're gonna see a lot more litigation around that area. And that area being, hey, these employers or companies fail to keep people safe or take reasonable steps to keep people safe uh, when they visited or interacted with folks from um, those employers' facilities. So I think that's something to think about. It is not a insignificant concern in my mind, um, but sometimes I think it gets lost. And I think that, uh, you know, if we, if you look at that situation and kind of, again, going through all these factors, you know, you might want to at least look at adopting a voluntary program or encouraging employees to go forward on a voluntary basis to get a vaccine. All right. So, all right. So we got, I know it's question time. Yeah. I think I put on my glasses. Great. Right. Every time I had a question, you answered it on the next slide. So that's a good sign. Adrian right. uh, in the chat thread asked, if you are applying for a new job, would it help to mention you are vaccinated, improve your chances? Well, uh, a COVID vaccination end up being something that uh, is an employer sought after trait. Yeah, I, I would not. Uh, well, from an employer's perspective, I wouldn't be asking about, hey, have you been vaccinated? in the interview process. Mm -hmm. Now, what you could do as an employer after an offer has been made, or you can simply say, hey, one of the things I wanna let you know, we require all of our employees and applicants uh, to get vaccinated. I mean, you could do that, but I wouldn't inquire or I wouldn't necessarily, and, I, and as an, an individual looking for a job, I wouldn't volunteer that information. Um, you know, whenever from an employer's perspective, uh, when particularly at the stage of interviewing for a, a job, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I tell employees, you know, try to stay away from asking information that might be health related. Yeah. Vaccines, vaccinations, they're not health exams, they're not uh, considered to be physicals under the EEOC, but I would stay away from that. I'm not sure if it's going to necessarily improve your chances of getting, uh, uh, getting a job. Uh, so I would probably, you know, say, you know, if you want to mention it, I, you know, I, it's probably not going to be something that the employer is going to seize upon. If I spoke to an employer about that, they say, hey, another bonus is this person's been vaccinated. I might say, well, let's don't look at that because I could see a situation where someone who's not vaccinated arguing, hey, I didn't get the job because they prefer folks who are vaccinated, but I can't get a vaccine because uh, I've got a disability or because of my religion. So in effect, you're discriminating against that individual because of a disability 
or a uh, because they have a, a religious uh, belief. And I'm talking about the individual who, who doesn't get the offer. So I, you know, to me, that conversation from a, from an applicant's perspective, I, that's great. You got vaccinated, but I don't know if that would necessarily help you in a job situation. Thank you. And uh, just an encouragement, if anyone does have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat thread. I guess, Steve, I would ask, so if an employer is trying to decide between mandatory vaccination, voluntary vaccination, or just doing nothing more than maybe encouraging it, would it be the type of work situation? Like I could see in a school or a manufacturing company or a healthcare setting, there might be more reason to uh, be firmer about mandatory or a, a very firm voluntary volunteer incentive versus a normal sort of office space. Is there kind of a standard across like what kind of work setting you're in and how people interact with each other? Yeah, I, I think that uh, what I'm seeing is that when you're talking about a healthcare environment, I think number one, that's probably where you're seeing the employees being more aggressive about this. Okay, we want our people to be vaccinated um, because obviously they're dealing with patients, some of these patients can have you know, situations where they have a compromised immune system or maybe they're elderly, or you may also see it in, obviously you see it in, in nursing homes and those facilities as well. And those where it's where I see it being more aggressive and, I, and for a reason. I mean, the risk I think you could argue are greater in those environments of someone uh, contracting and having uh, COVID and having a serious health consequence as a result. Um, so I'm seeing that in, in in other workplaces, for example, manufacturing, for example, a number of folks, have been, they've instituted uh, <clears throat> um, different safety procedures, but a lot of times they're working more closely with each other on the line. And in those situations, there's more of a voluntary situation where, hey, we're encouraging our folks to go forward and, and get vaccinated. Um, I, I, I can tell you too, for example, I know Aldi and, and Trader Joe, for example, they've instituted voluntary programs that will encourage people to go and and get vaccinated and if they show proof of vaccination uh they get you know either two hours of pay or four hours pay and i think you're going to see more of that in those types of industries where you know you're dealing with the public you're interacting more with people um and in terms of other industries i mean I, i'm for example uh, offices and things like that where you have folks still re working remotely or there's uh there's less of a reason to interact frequently not seeing those folks taking a position on voluntary or mandatory vaccinations as of yet. But I think that as the vaccines become more available, widely available, I think that's going to come. I think that's down the road. So last question for me, one of the hottest areas that affects practically every human on the planet seems to be the school system. And I know that uh, teachers are covered um, by some collective bargaining, bargaining union protection. Mm -hmm. Have you seen or heard any discussion of mandatory voluntary or no vaccine policy when it relates to schools, private or public? Yeah, so this is an issue um, and you know, it's playing out in really all across, across the country with teachers. And the, and the, and it's because of, um, and you're right, I mean, they're typically uh, in, in the, at least in the public sector, uh, there are a number of teachers unions that are kind of pushing back. I haven't seen much in terms of, um, now in, in terms of, in terms of the, the vaccination and vaccines, there's been some pushback and what's happening is there's a negotiation that's going on with the schools. Now, one of the things that's interesting with you know, the science on this, and, and I think it's, there's a lot of controversy. There's, there's been an argument that uh, the risk of transmission in schools is less than in other places because, you know, I've heard different, mm -hmm. different articles on this that, you know, kids don't, don't spread it as, as, as easily as, as, uh, as, as you might think, or as in other environments, things like that. But yeah, there's negotiation going on between a lot of teachers unions and school systems. And, um, it is a it is a hot hot area of contention because uh, I understand the teacher's position, but there are some what's interesting some unions that are really reluctant about the vaccine because they're worried about um, how safe it is. You know, this these vaccines have been adopted under some emergency authorization, and there's concern that there's not enough study has been done, and so um, you know I, I I don't know where that's going to go. Um, 
I think eventually, uh, as the population, as the vaccines become more widely spread and more people are vaccinated or have the vaccination, that it's going to go away. But I think that's going to play out over the next several months before we get any resolution on that. I think that's a great point. Obviously, as the vaccines become um, more well known, more adopted, more track record, um, all of us will begin to sort out for ourselves. Did I hear someone trying to talk? Or is that just me? Okay. Well, Steve, this has been incredibly enlightening. And like I said, your uh, presentation was so well put together that every time I thought of a question, you did answer it on the next slide. Uh, so I feel much more educated on this topic. I'm so glad we had such a nice turnout of people who I know uh, represent a lot of companies here in Tulsa. If anyone needs to be connected to you, I'd be happy to do that. We've also recorded the session and I'll be sending those out about once a month to the people who are registered for our series. Next Next week, we have the Mental Health Association. And I also want to let people know that in March, uh, we're going to be offering uh, the Mental Health Association's QPR training in suicide prevention. So we'll be promoting that soon. That date is going to be March 23rd. So Steve, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.